The letters I have written have undoubtedly sealed my doom. Sometimes it seems as though you can never have too many vampire movies or television series. Blow spoilers, yes you can. But if you are going to make a vampire movie, you might as well drive a stake through the heart of the OG. Was she in great pain? Yeah, she was in great pain. Then we cut off her head and drove a stake to her heart. Our master filmmaker takes on Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> I've seen many strange things already. Bloody wolves chasing me through some blue inferno. Bram Stoker's Dracula is a luscious 1992 retelling of the story by director Francis Ford Coppola, where he attempted to tell a visually striking adaptation of Stoker's 1897 novel. Bram Stoker's Dracula is a beautiful looking film that perhaps struggles in getting across its story clearly. Bram Stoker's Dracula, or to save time, B.S. Dracula was a successful film on its release and for many is a definitive take on Dracula. Though for others, it really is B.S. Dracula. I think strange things which I dare not confess to my own soul. I land somewhere in the middle. It's a grand experiment that, like me in a flight simulator, doesn't always land. He's suffering from a violent brain fever. It's the late 19th century and young Jonathan Harker is sent to Transylvania to finalise a property sale in England. Harker meets the buyer, Count Dracula, who of course lives in a spooky castle. But very soon, Harker believes that something might just be a little off about his host. It's probably nothing, it's just culture shock. A series of unusual, unsettling and creepy events mount up, where Harker doesn't really know if Dracula is his friend or his foe. Harker is kept a sort of prisoner by Dracula's brides, who suck his blood to keep him weak, though Dracula himself heads for England. Harker's predecessor on the Dracula account, Renfield, is in an asylum where he's cared for by Dr. Jack Seward, who is also one of three suitors for the hand of rich girl Lucy, whose best friend is Mina Murray, who's Jonathan Harker's girlfriend, and also the spitting image of Dracula's long dead wife, Elisabetta. I mean, I guess there's a strong resemblance, though obviously Mina is more of a before image rather than the version of Elisabetta with hundreds of years of decomposition. Once in England, a rejuvenated Dracula meets Mina, tries to have his way with her, while Mina's friend Lucy has been bitten by some creature and Dr. Seward has sent for his mentor, Professor Van Helsing. Lucy is losing a lot of blood, but the idea that it's a vampire that's siphoning off her blood just seems preposterous. But then this Van Helsing dude is a pretty preposterous guy. Draco. Mina receives a letter from Jonathan and then she begins her journey to join him in Transylvania despite her feelings of longing for Dracula. Mina and Jonathan marry and then they return to London in less time than it takes me to say they marry and then return to London. A hunt is organised to find Dracula's lair. Even no refuge. Let the exorcism begin. <laughs> Dracula escapes since he can take on many forms whether it be an animal or even a gas which would explain some of the more diabolical smells at conventions. Dracula and Mina's love story takes a turn when she begs to be turned into a vampire, which does not mean taking a job in marketing, but literally being turned into an undead creature of the night, and I'm still not talking about a job in marketing. Attempts to kill Dracula are unsuccessful, while it's only a matter of time before Mina turns, and so everyone then journeys to Transylvania to try and catch Dracula. It does sound like a lot of faffing about, but at least everyone got a seat upgrade by using points. All of the characters split up to try and get to Dracula first. Mina tries to tempt Van Helsing and before long there's a chase on the Borgo Pass to head off Dracula before his carriage arrives at the castle before dark, though he will be run through by Morris. They allow Dracula and Mina to retreat inside and embrace before Dracula reverts to his original human form as Vlad. If this at all feels abrupt to you, then don't worry, that's completely how I felt when the end title started flashing on screen. It's a film that started by being creepy, then got sexy, then weird, then had a chase scene, and then ended as a tragic goth romance. Bram Stoker's Dracula was an experience that I did not hate, but I also can't say I love it. Yeah, why not? I would say it's a good film mixed in with bits of a bad film. The Count must sail round the rock of Gibraltar, where we have posted a lookout, and then on to the Black Sea port at Varna. A film where they could only afford to storyboard every second page of the script, and so that's what they filmed. What they did film oozes style, with some absolutely fantastic production design, 
and some woefully inadequate storytelling if you expect a movie to sort of like tell a story. The way he looked at Mina's picture fills me with dread. It's a lovely thing to look at. It's not especially scary in any major way, I mean there's not a lot of gore, but there are buckets of blood, it's a vampire film. And of course, it's a film where choices were made. The Count has insisted I remain for a month to tutor him in English custom. Decisions were reached and implemented. Were they all great choices? Sometimes, but not always. Francis Ford Coppola wanted the costumes of designer Eiko Ishioka to be the focus rather than a series of grand sets. The costumes are quite luscious, though the sets aren't exactly three cardboard walls and a rented fireplace. There are so many ways to express how fantastic this film looks. And here they are. Number one. Wow, look at that. Number two. Man, that's amazing. Number three. Quah! Number four. Mighty impressive. Number five. Far out. Number six. If I may inquire, what in fact happened to Mr. Renfield in Transylvania? The film's most often criticised element, Keanu Reeves, or more accurately, his attempt at a British accent. Listening to it, it's pretty average, but it is more his stiff delivery, which does sound like Reeves has had a metal pole riveted to his spine. It's also not actually in that much of the film, so it will do. I will give it my full attention. At the time, Reeves was so well known for his surfer dude persona in films like Bill and Ted that typecasting was strong, even among critics. No way. Reeves is still not known as an actor with a multitude of voices and accents. Is there much of a difference in his delivery as either Neo or John Wick? I know now that I am a prisoner. So if you can put his accent and stilted performance aside, and man, I know it is hard for some, he's decent enough in what actually amounts to quite a small role. You shouldn't talk about my fiance in such a way. Winona Ryder is slightly more successful in this regard, where she starts off as the prim and proper Mina, trying not to be led astray by her thirsty bestie Lucy, and later she's consumed by her feelings for Dracula. We are to be married. I will never see you again, Mina. Gary Oldman had the hardest role to fill, one where he wanted to make his version of Dracula a definitive version. Some of the other cast members would find Oldman's onset manner tough to deal with, though this film does live or die on whether the film could make a unique characterization of Dracula. The relationship was not entirely successful. One that didn't just channel previous versions of the character. Oldman's intense characterization in his first major American film has to overcome a variety of looks that either work for you or they might seem a bit on the silly side. I am Dracula. To many, those looks have become iconic, since from a practical point of view, this was for a lot of people their first big budget look at Dracula. But I land on the side of, well, choices had to be made. I give you life eternal. Dracula has many looks in this film. He's young, he's old, he's decrepit, he's not so decrepit, he's a wolf. Dracula's looks vary between red carpet at the Met Gala, presenting an award at the VMAs, and a Heidi Klum Halloween costume. Oldman's scenes were shot later during filming, and he worked with makeup artists on creating look after look for Dracula. The downside is, there are so many different versions, where he's armoured, a bat, goth wedding celebrant, or whatever, that it does make it more difficult for the audience to keep track of what's up with Dracula, and he has promised to make me immortal. There was also Tom Wade says Renfield, where he does almost literally nothing of note in the entire film. I'm having horrible nightmares, Jack. Sadie Frost as Lucy, Monica Bellucci as one of Dracula's brides, and the trio of Richard E. Grant, Carrie Elwes, and Bill Campbell as Lucy's suitors. Last week he wanted to marry her. Now he wants to have her committed. If you've never seen Anthony Hopkins overacting, you should A, watch more of his movies, and B, watch this movie, because Anthony Hopkins giving it just a bit more welly than the role demands is still more interesting than many actors' most perfectly measured efforts. Here he takes on a potentially dull and dry character Vampires do exist. and attempts to make him the most interesting one in the film. It's possible that nobody told Hopkins that the movie wasn't about his character, or if they did, perhaps Hopkins shrugged his shoulders and replied, sure, but what are you going to do about it, boyo? Now I've done an empty stomach! Jack! Yes, sir! Ah, no. I starve! Feed me! This movie is a result of Winona Ryder apparently bringing James V. Hart's script to the attention of Francis Ford Coppola, where, just a few years earlier, Ryder had pulled out of appearing in The Godfather Part 3 at the very last minute, which resulted in Coppola casting his young daughter, Sophia Coppola, in the role of Mary Corleone. 
despite Sofia Coppola having absolutely no wish to ever act in movies. Which is cool, she didn't. After Coppola had a tremendous decade in the 70s, his films in the 1980s were a mixed bag critically, where several of his films released in that decade had been financial disappointments. This is not Blood, but Red Ink. The third installment of The Godfather had restored some box office luster to his reputation, which gave Columbia the confidence to finance a fairly big budget horror film. Made by a man who, while he mainly made good films, let's be honest, did not always have the greatest reputation for consistently making profitable big budget films. No doubt from the passage of the Count ship. Part of Coppola's pitch, to avoid being at the mercy of things like the weather, let's make the bulk of the film on a soundstage and a studio backlot. Music! Those animals! The music by Wojciech Kela is suitably old school gothic horror, something that really does match the visuals perfectly. Blood. Coppola wanted to make a version of Stoker's book, even putting Stoker's name in the film's title. The thing is, Bram Stoker's book isn't a conventional linear narrative, but a collection of letters, diary entries and newspaper stories that tell the story. So if you want an explanation as to why the film doesn't always feel like it's tightly telling one story from one character's point of view, well, the overall plot and major story beats stay relatively faithful to the novel. It is a beast, a monster. Oh, wow. Stoker may have written a fascinating book, but his spec scripts for Buffy the Vampire Slayer would have been returned unread. Taking a page from the book, the film tries to cover the toing and froing with letters and diary entries and narrations, which doesn't always alleviate the sense of narrative whiplash. Pro tip, this is not a film where you can take a toilet break in the middle and expect that you didn't miss much. In fact, watching the film a second time does actually pay a sort of a dividend. This one we fight, this one we face has the strength of 20 or more people. Bram Stoker wrote and published his book at the tail end of the 19th century, and while it was successful enough at the time, it wasn't something that did much for Stoker in his lifetime. Films came along, and Dracula seemed like the perfect character to scare last night's strudel out of audiences. Nosferatu in 1922 was an early, legally off-brand version of Dracula, but it was Universal's classic 1932 film from Todd Browning, which starred Bela Lugosi, that imprinted itself on audiences for decades. Either the English version or the Spanish language version filmed on the exact same sets at night. That look of Dracula dressing up for a night on the town after somebody comped him some free tickets for the opera has become iconic. I dress like this every time I get called for jury selection, but for some reason I always end up going home early. Vampire stories have often had a sexual undertone that seems to have become more and more pronounced as time goes on. Can man and woman really do that? The most interesting thing about the film for me is not the actual film, but the way it was made. In particular, Coppola wanted to use the oldest of old-fashioned effects techniques, not even cutting-edge opticals and animation as most early 1990s films used, but techniques used at the dawn of filmmaking. Coppola could have filmed the movie in Romania on location, but he decided he'd have more control over the environment if the entire film was made in a soundstage in Los Angeles. That's both the interiors and exteriors. And then, rather than using the cutting-edge special effects of the day, which meant compositing several pieces of film in post-production using an optical printer, Coppola hired his son Roman to put together effects which could be gathered in camera. So we have lots of models and miniatures, matte paintings, scenes where someone was shot moving backwards and then the film would be reversed. There would be ramping up and slowing down of frame rates, forced perspective, shadow puppets, back projection, sets on gimbals, and the riskiest move, double exposing effect shots on the same piece of film. Even with all the old-fashioned techniques on show, there were still many shots that had to be completed with the then-standard method of compositing film images using optical printers. I'm somebody who likes special effects of all types, practical, optical, computer-generated effects. All three methods, when done not well, or done on the cheap, or dashed out quickly, can look awful and completely pull you out of a film. But truth be told, in-camera tricks are just a little bit more interesting to read about. How can you call this science? The effects trickery here is perhaps more interesting to me than the film when taken as a whole. The effects are fascinating when they work, which is, of course, most of the time. Though, funnily enough, they don't make the film amount to an unqualified masterpiece. If it's your first Dracula film, then it's your formative one, and it'll be the one that you hang on to as the baseline for what a Dracula film is. That is totally cool with me. But if they could have just used some of that amazing inventiveness to make the story work a little better. Something just went up there, sucked it out of her, and 
flew away, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, it's no George Hamilton in love at first bite, but then what is? I understand it is a wonder of the civilised world. Coppola would not turn the success of this film into more high-profile gigs, as he'd end up spending much of the 90s as a director for hire before returning to make small indie films like he'd always wanted to do. And for whatever reason, he ploughed $120 million of his own money into a passion project that proved that Francis Ford Coppola's retirement project was to discover a new and more effective way of clogging sewers with cash. I mean, it's his own cash, so, you know, go ahead, flush. Dracula would turn out to be Coppola's last big movie that was also an unambiguous success. It could have been a great thing rather than just an interesting thing. Something that put Coppola on the path that would get him the gig directing Jack. Perhaps he should have made a musical, Cope Rock. It is a man himself. Yeah. Look, he's growing young. Bram Stoker's Dracula is a film that's lovely to look at, but don't ask me what's happening. If you enjoyed this review, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos. I almost feel pity for anything so hunted as this Count. How can you pity such a creature?